We're up to our, our star appearance here. David Grady is going to show us how he made that beautiful Taurus. Okay. If I'd have known I was going to do a demonstration on this, I would have took a lot more more pictures. And my son actually has a piece, a Taurus. He I, he had been after me for several years to, to make him a Taurus. And I kept telling him, I don't know how to do that. I'm not good enough to do that. And um, I looked at Malcolm Tibbetts' directions in his book, which were very good. But uh, he waste, he didn't, I would say wasted, but he lost half the wood that he cut. Almost exactly half. And I wasn't going to do that. So my son finally, he was persistent. He found another video that showed how to cut, make the rings, and not waste any wood except for the kerf. So, okay, I'll give it a try. And that's how it turned out. Approximately 12 inches in diameter, uh, four inches in the middle, and it's around four or a little right. more cross section of the donut. Uh, Mary helped me on that also. She's here somewhere, but she she left the room. Uh, this is just acknowledgments. Malcolm, he had books and videos I learned a lot from. If you want to go back after sometime after this presentation and learn how to do this, and the guy on YouTube, his name is Andy Phillip. And uh, he had a procedure for chucking this thing up so uh, two or three different ways during the turning and uh, it worked anyway i used his basic procedure you won't have to listen to me talk but you're not going to hear him either because he doesn't talk at all oh. he shows you videos and that's it you got to figure it out so yeah. with what i'm going to tell you and what in the video you'll be able to make one of these you use lloyd johnson's wood turner pro software and after i got it originally designed i, I tweaked <laughs> The dimensions to use up as much as I could of the piece of curly walnut, not curly walnut, curly maple that I had that I was using. So we can move on. Oh, there's there's the story that we already passed. Our, I got I did that too early. Anyway, I told Davey I would never make one of those. My wife had a story about never. So it's on the bottom of the the uh, stand for it. There's the two boards I used, except for the little piece that I used for a curly maple for the stand. Um, I used almost all the wall, the mesquite, the maple, and I had about a foot left of that uh, real pretty walnut. One at a time, one at a time. If you've been to any basic segmenting presentation class or anything, these are the things you're going to need to know. You need to know, and I should have put pi first. You need to know pi, 3.1416, and 360 degrees in a circle, and that's about it. Circum the circumference is pi D. The segment length is uh, the long end of your segment, uh, and it's the circumference divided by your number of segments, which is your choice. You, you choose how many segments you're going to make in a ring. And you divide it into the circumference. So divide that number into the circumference tells you how long your segment length is going to be. The instructions normally, when you're building something, segmenting is going to tell you to divide that angle that you get by dividing your angle, so your 360 degrees by your number of segments. That's going to give me your segment angle. You divide that by two, you get your miter angle, which is usually at each end of the segment. Uh, this is this this uh, particular event here is going to be different. This uh, the actual rings are cut so that the whole the angle, the entire angle, not divided by two, is on one end of the of the ring, which has become a segment, and on the other end it's square, just like it was when you built it. These dimensions were partially chosen, but by uh, convenience of the numbers. In themselves, it doesn't say that there, but um, I picked it about a foot. My lathe will turn 16 inches, so a foot. And I need a little bit more than a foot uh, for some of the chucking mechanisms. 
The smaller diameter in the, in the center was about, and the opening is about four inches each. Uh, it worked out pretty good just to divide by three, the 12 inches. The smaller rings are made up of 12 segments. That's what I chose. I kind of think I would wish I'd have done 16, but I didn't. Um, to make, I chose 60 rings that divides into 360 quite nicely. Um, so I built 30 rings and split them in half. And that gave me 60 rings plus four spare of each species. And they're all split in half. 34 rings required 408 segments each. Four required a total of four, 400, 408 segments. The final count being 816 after splitting the rings. Mm, it's your choice how, how big you want to make the donut hole, but three into 12 seemed mighty easy. And it looked good. I had to use two of the spare walnut rings to fix a problem, so I'm sure glad I made some spares. And interestingly enough, it's not on there, but the way I used those was not to, in a normal way, I took them and, and put them this way and made them so that as I slid them together, it got bigger. I actually had a gap that I had to fill when I started the final glue ups. We won't do much with it tonight with this. I can get this. There's a camera, but there you go. Okay. This is a Straka chuck. I'm not sure about the pronunciation of that. Uh, I've used this for several things. Uh, we'll go over it in more detail. You have a faceplate and a, and a disc that has a, a, a hole drilled in it that this bolt will fit through. That becomes important later, not tonight. Be sure these, these all threads are, are quarter twenties. Be sure that I, I used carriage bolts, be sure that you put the nut and the washer and the end of this bolt on the same side as your face plate. Otherwise, you're going to be working over here and those things are going to be eating you alive. I like on an object this big, I like to put some a little protection around the edges so they don't make a little cut in my fingers and, and hands every time I bump into one. So I don't have one on there. It probably came off. I, this is the padding I used that you can buy it at Walmart on a roll. It's for RVs. Uh, I used Elmer's spray craft glue and it did not stick worth a darn. But it stayed on long enough for me to do what I need to do. What's next? Uh, that was covered that. This picture there is from Wood Turner Pro. That's a, a segmenting program uh, offered by Lloyd Johnson. You may remember Lloyd, he came down a couple of years ago and did a demo for us and did a little two day open segmenting class at Wood Turner, at uh, Woodcraft. Um, that particular calculation there is kind of small, but it's made to build the four inch rings. Uh, I can't read the dimensions from here, Jim. 12 segments, 12 segments, one inch thick board, outside dimension uh, diameter is four inches, inside diameter is one inch, no spacers. No spacers. And you put those, your inputs, the bottom part down there is your outputs, and it's repeated over on the side under the picture of the ring. It tells you your segment length. All right. There you go. Now we're looking at it. Normal segmenting segment. Uh, from here, to, from, from the top and the bottom, the way I've got it, that is your segment angle, your entire angle. One side of it is called, only one part of that angle is called a miter angle. This is your thickness. This is your segment length. That's what you get when you divide your number of segments into the circumference. And there's another measurement somewhere. In, inside and outside diameter, mm, thickness, width, the width of your board. I made, for the torus, I made it a little wide. I'll tell you why later. Uh, the boards I was working with, while they were real pretty, they were just barely, barely thick enough. That's why I came up with a gap. 
if you consider after you build a ring, what do we do with those rings? After I built these rings, they were approximately that thick. That's about three-fourths of an inch. They needed to be an inch. Um, when you, after you split the rings in two, these rings actually become segments. They kept them that way. Then you <coughs> feed that information back into Wood Turner Pro again to build a 12-inch circle. And there, there's the information for that. I didn't, in neither one of these calculations do you allow, you have to manually allow for spares. If you put it into the program, it's going to change you know, all your angles and everything. So you've just got to kind of wing it on that and decide how much you need to make the spares that you want to have. And we can move. So this shows you that you're going to have 60 segments with one inch thick boards and an outside diameter of 12 inches and an inside diameter of four inches. Yep. And that four into that particular 12 right there gives you your four and four for the hole and four for the other side of the donut. Uh, the calculations down at the bottom, you can ignore for the most part. Those are if you want to grain match a particular board. Um, you cut them so that you don't lose that. You lose a the angle every time instead of flipping your segment over to cut it or your stock you actually waste some wood that way for colors I, my son wanted this he wanted it in two colors didn't care what so i kind of got the idea from malcolm he built one with a light and dark he's maple and walnut uh the desired color arrangement on the, the whole form was a gradual fading from light to dark beginning at opposite points. And that made a difference into where I started my planning. I had to have this so I could, I wanted to have it so I could take it apart and put the last glue up um, in the white area and in the black area. I didn't want it out in the middle of the segments somewhere where I, if I sanded off of those, it'd be quite noticeable. If I had to sand a little bit off of three or four uh, maple discs, you wouldn't be able to even tell it. Uh, I used Microsoft Excel just for to arrange the colors. The gray looking or light blue, blue segments are walnut and the white one, the light color ones are the maple. Each vertical column is one ring. And then going across or you can see your segments. Now they, you're going to, you see how there's the, the columns are numbered one to 30. I made 30 rings that are going to be split into half into 60 rings. And then I also allowed, because I had to have them in my count over on the right hand side, I, I made uh, allowances so I'd get the enough wood to make the spares. I didn't do that at all. In, in if you start on the right hand end or start on the left, there's, there's uh, two maple rows and then I start putting a, a walnut in there, one or two, and then uh, that gradually increased until it was solid walnut. And then it goes back down in a similar fashion. I, I didn't use any mathematical formula or any um, super, super sensitive senses to, to arrange those. It was just solely by eye. I scattered those around as I increased the number of walnut segments in each ring. And then I, I had to Excel total those down, you know, those vertical columns down and gave me the quantity of of walnuts and maples that I needed for each ring. Mm -hmm. Now we can go. There's the bucket and segments after I cut them and dumped them out on the table. That was quite a pile. This is this was my some of my testing I did. On the left, you see three rings. They're, they're a full ring. They're not split. They're kind of wide. You'll find out about that and why they're so wide in a little while. And that being the center diameter is small. Uh, I practice several times You're using rubber bands or any type of clamping. It's good to practice because you start getting into angles. Your clamps will slip, rubber bands will slip. You just have to need to practice. And you find out whether your cuts are, are uh, accurate. The large ring on the right 
was as best I could tell. I made just took some scrap wood and cut small segments to the angle that my rings were going to be. So there's 60 small segments uh, put together with a hose clamp. You can see sticking out the top, just to ch kind of check the angle. That's all. It was, that's all that was for. Next, another view. Uh, nothing's glued up at that point. Uh, over on the right hand side, inside that big circle, I made some. Well, I didn't make them inside the circle, but there's a four inch square that uh, was kind of like this. I, I had split it actually on the bandsaw. Uh, but this was was not angled on the uh, like that. It was a solid piece. You need to make several of these to test with. Uh, you don't want to be testing on those rings that you cut segments and glue them Just get some square stock, <coughs> the dimension of your that you need thickness, and the square would fit your donut to fit your ring. So now you can split that on your bandsaw as long as you want to use up scrap until you're satisfied you got it down. There you can see that this piece here with its mate sitting inside that circle. And okay, go ahead. Now there's there's my work table, two folding tables, a stool with a light on it and a magnifier. And there's a piece of drain board that they cut out for either our sink or our stove one. And uh, it's pretty flat, so that's what I use. And glue comes oh. off of it for you. I'm practicing gluing these things up or, or just rubber banding them. And then as when you, when you get to gluing, you need to keep them as level as, as possible, especially if you're running short on thickness as I was. Those are all ready for gluing, though. The, the, my choice of where to put the segments as the number of dark ones and light ones change from one end to the other. It's probably a good time. I kind of said what I marked them with, which I really didn't remember because it had been so long since I built that. Uh, but number these somewhere or another where you can see the numbers and that will make you be able to identify which ring, which goes in order. And they're going to be going in circles, so they're going to come around and meet each other on the other side. And you need to keep have those numbers so that you can identify which one goes where and which way to. I don't know that which way to turn it makes much difference because I just scattered those dark ones in there by anyway. There, I've got them all glued, and they're on uh, some kind of sticks. I I raised up the head on my drum sander and took, stuck two scrap boards in there and lowered the head back down to hold them. And that made me two two sticks to put all those rings on. And then they stayed overnight. Several rubber bands are in order uh, to keep those together. And there again, make sure they're as flat as you can get them. Now those are all glued and un unrubber banded and all that. And there's two spare ones down at the bottom. I only built two. I wish I'd have built more since I for sure used one. I used everything except that maple ring right there. Those are the rings. They're glued up. They're not split. You can sand them a little bit on a disc sander or a drum sander. Remove absolutely as little material as possible to get them pretty flat on both sides. Those are ready for. Those are ready to be split, which is the real trick. This board is not the one I used, but it's just like the one I used. I marked off my segment angle, which was six degrees, 60 segments, which each one of those rings becomes a segment, 60 segments into 360 degrees gives you 12. And so that's a miter angle, I guess. Anyway, I, I cut the, I cut that angle off this, off this board right there. I'll have to clarify that to my own liking later. Um, and I put that down on my bandsaw table, tilted my bandsaw table until that angled in absolutely flat on the blade. So I didn't have to have a jig that would be tilting or trying to adjust or anything. I used the table, the tilt of the table 
to get the angle I wanted. And that's all that was used for. Uh, from right from right in there on, you need to be as accurate as you possibly can. I'm going to call this a sled, but sleds imply movement. This, this did not move. It was clamped securely to the to the tilted table, the bandsaw, with with this face away from the blade. So it was, if I were looking at the bandsaw from the working side, this was over here, and this part was out on the table, so that the blade was in this area somewhere. Anyway, this is as I was looking at it working. I promise. You. Okay, this was all clamped down on the table. The table's tilted. Under that yellow control for my dust collector, there's two sticks there. I made those. They are absolutely exactly the same length. I clamped them together, butted each end up to the, to the disc sander until they were right. Didn't care what the dimension was, as long as well, they were relatively long. I could put one at each end of this. Now we can go back to here. I put one at each end of this uh, face over toward over to the fence. And can, since they were the same length, I could put one out there and one out here. And can, I could square that with the, with can, the table and the can blade. Can you turn it this way a little bit? This way yeah. or the other way? Keep going. There you go. That's good. Okay. So I had, I had those little sticks in here. And they measured to the fence. So that enabled me to, every time I made an adjustment on this, and there were several to ever get it where I wanted it, I could always square this sled to the, to the drill, drill, to the bandsaw really easily and fairly quickly and clamp it back down. This is the only part of this sled that moved. So you... You, you, this is a little eighth inch tall piece of board here. Um, this probably should have been a little wider, but double side, double sticky tape. So you away from this is the way it's going to sit over there. Uh, you put it up against your little fence there. The quantity of number of rings I had enabled me to have a straight line I drew right down the center of this jig, and it would line up with opposing opposing joints in, in the rings that I was using. If, if your rings don't come out that way, you can always draw a, a little mark and on each on opposing segments of a ring and get the same effect. So now we've got that taped onto there. I'm over here. This is glued on here securely. And the blade on this was around in here somewhere on mine. So I, my, I had a lot of room for my hands. When, when the rings got to the blade, you want to go steadily but fairly slow. And just to get it started, I kind of put a finger on it just to hold it. But you got to keep this up against this, this fence. And there you, you slice one ring in half. I threw it in the floor. So now you've got 60 rings that are angled like that. The, the bottom piece on the sled, that's, that's at an angle. The little strip, on not on the sled, but on your push board or whatever. Uh, yes and no. Right there, it is because this, it got that close to the to the blade. It was not, it was not angled by design. But you're right, Nick. That is angled. wasn't it really intended to be. When I put it on there, it was flat. Okay. Uh, didn't need to be angled. And that was caused. That was caused by the thickness, the the lack of thickness in my stock. Um, 
I had two pretty pieces of wood that I wanted to use. And here's a spacer that I had that I made. I think I had two of these, and they went under this sled where it was raised above the. Hey, David, this is Chris table. So, because I didn't want this thing wobbling around or anything, if it was not on a solid piece of table where it extended out, I'd get it, find some way or another to put that spacer around it and clamp it so that it wasn't wobbling around at all. You don't want this hey, part to move Chris at Buckingham. all. <clears throat> David? Yes. So, this is Chris Buckingham. Just a quick okay. question. So, on your rings, um, every other ring you need to rotate halfway. Is that right? When you're doing you need the to have down. them marked in such a way so that the so that you will know when you when you split that you're going to have a wide side and a narrow side on both sides right because each ring is going to come out wedge shaped even though you only cut one one angle on it right but on your next piece don't you want those segments to be offset by a half of Segment width. I made a mistake when I did that. I, I didn't allow for brick brick laying okay. segments. I should have, and I, I finally realized I had, but I'd already cut all the segments. And I'd already designed that spreadsheet with, with my layout, and I thought I'm just going to go ahead with it, since it was sort of it was halfway random anyway. Uh, I wasn't too concerned about it. I just wanted to keep them in order as far as quantity of, of during ring assembly or during assembly of the donut. When you're assembling the donut, yeah. Uh, there was a really neat trick, and this another reason why I picked Andy Phillips because he had a great idea. Okay, I'll wait for the good idea. Uh, we'll, we'll get we'll get there. All right, thanks. Any more? But you need to have you need to be very organized and have your rings marked so that you'll know which way you want the wide side to be when it goes past that bandsaw blade. Um, and then you need to have it so that you realize you're going to have two pieces. They both need to have marks on them when you're done, so you'll know where they go in the in the ring in the donut. So your angle came totally from the, the table of the bandsaw? Yes, ma'am. Let's go back to the presentation and see if I had anything else there to... Yeah, I, I wanted to ask a question before we did. Okay. So the, the reference line that you put on each uh, ring uh, need to be oriented uh, next to each neighbor so that your angle continues yes. it to make a torus. Because if, if you get it out of line, then you start to get something that yeah, spirals yeah, it's, out of yeah, it's shaped. Yeah, your your flat side uh, of every other no, your flat your wide side of every split ring needs to be together. Yeah. If you stack a wide one over here and then a narrow one, you've negated your angle, you're back to a flat piece of wood. Yeah. And in, if you don't put the wide sides, say over here and the narrow sides all over there, in addition to going around in a circle like that, you're going to start going this way. Does that make any sense? There's a lot, lot to keep track of. Yeah, there, there is. But study Andy's video uh, and you can get it. All right, there I wrote, the table has been tilted to the, go back one, two, to the desired angle. The flat part of the sled is against and is securely clamped to the bandsaw table. Rings are attached to a slider that is against the left side of the braced fence. Make the slider, now this is from an operator's point of view, make the slider long enough to get all the attached rings. I think Andy did four, split four rings at a time. I only did two. I wasn't all that brave. And you'll have plenty of room left on this slider for you to be hold, holding on to it and not get close to the blade. <clears throat> so you just held the slider with your hands up against that. Mm -hmm. that yeah, fence. there's no mechanism to hold the slider against that outside fence. That's you have to do that 
and you have to be mindful all the time because you're moving your hands are moving towards the blade yeah towards the business side of the blade <laughs> yeah. let's go to the next one. Oh, there if you look there over by the blade the bent saw there's a rib disc there that has just been cut now there's another view that was from a photo that i had taken or mary, maybe mary took it uh probably that same ring had just been cut and because i only had one on there now when i did it under under production i had two at a time so one had already been split can't really see the blade but it's there uh to the right of this of the of the uh, fence uh, towards the front of the picture about a third of the way back you see a clamp on coming up on top of that the base of that sled and there's a i'll guarantee you there is a spacer underneath there and that's clamped to the deal where you put your fence and slide it back and forth on the bandsaw itself and uh, there was somewhere else. Uh, there's another clamp over there at the very back by that orange, behind that orange uh, tape measure. I think that's all the, tape, the clamps I had to use. But I think I had to have a spacer under each one of them or I would have bowed the, the sled. This is just telling you, remember your color plan, be consistent, mark your rings so you'll know where they go and which way they're supposed to be turned. In my thing that I made, the color uh, arrangement was such that I didn't really care if I got, I didn't care whether I used the side of the, of the ring that was closest to the blade or closest to the fence or the other one. I did, didn't really care. They both had the same number of black, uh, of dark segments in it. So I didn't worry about that. But you might have to, depending on what you had. Uh, difficult your color pattern is if you're doing a real color real a real more complicated color pattern you are going to want to take into consideration the brick bricklay effect because that's gonna that's gonna make a difference on on your pattern where are we now oh you're looking at me again poor guy next there you go cut a square a test square makes several makes splitting the rings you Use a good double-sided tape. I ordered some from Amazon. I tried to find something that looked like what Andy used in his video, but I couldn't. But I thought I got was pretty good. Attach two or three rings to your slider with the fatty end marks at the top. I'm not sure that they do need to be either at the top or the bottom. They need to be all consistent if you want it. If the, if the rotation of them is going to make any difference when you send them. I only did two at a time. Align segments joints with other each other, and uh, that didn't work with this this one. That wasn't going to work. If, if that won't work for the number of segments you have in the ring, you'll need to make a little mark to know where the center of the two segments are that you're going to align with your line that's on your sled on your slider. When you, when you put these down on that mask on that uh, double sticky tape, mash on them, put some weight on them for a few good few seconds to make them grab a hold pretty good. You don't want them flying around, obviously. Uh, I think we've covered most of that. After you're done, you just pull this slider off the away from the bandsaw, stop your blade. Go get your segments that are laying on the table and then take the segments off your slider carefully. They're going to be thin in places. If you bend them too much, they're going to break. The thick sides won't be a problem. Uh, how, did you, how did you, did you, did you use a, uh, a knife to, uh, pry them off of the slider? I think I did at first and, uh, I, it wasn't a, Putty knife. It was. Uh, it was all I have. A knife. It's, it's like it's. It's like a fixed blade knife, but it's a. Uh, it's got a little short, stubby blade. Okay. Those are split rings, bunch of them. 
I did go back and, and I just touch sanded them to my drum sander, not my drum sander, my disc sander, just enough to smooth them out a little bit. I didn't try to make them uh, exactly smooth, perfect, but I did try to get the high, high places out of them and keep them level. So you just touch them on the, when you're, when you're working with a drum, a disc sander and you want to take little small deals off of it, Turn the turn the turn the sander on. Let it sp let it spin up and get your. Can we have the camera? Oh, we got the camera. Yeah. So we'll say the, the the disc was here. Let it spin up. Turn it off. Let it spin down just a little bit. You don't have to sand it when it's going 100 miles an hour, and then just try to keep them level. Consistent pressure all the way around. You shouldn't have to take very much off. You don't have to get every bandsaw mark out of there because they're going to be filled up with glue. Okay, now we can go back. Any more questions so far? This slide here just shows the way I organize these so I could keep them in groups of six, I think. Six rings, and they had to be the ones that were going to be in order. They're stacked in order by the way I numbered them. And I tied them up with some string. You could use a rubber band or whatever. Did you write the number on the edge or on the face? Both. I originally wrote it on the face, and then I realized, you got to glue these together. You're not going to be able to see that. <laughs> and I wanted to be able to see the numbers so that I could keep them going in order. Uh, How thick were those at the thickest part now? Uh, I'm guessing they were half an inch at the most, maybe, maybe five eighths. They should have been thicker. I guarantee you, but it worked. Yeah. It came out beautiful. But it caused, it caused some heartaches. I'm, I'm well practiced at fixing problems. I, I create so many of them. <laughs> now, don't forget when you start gluing these together, you have a right radial alignment to match your color scheme and the, the, the fat sides all need to be together and the skinny sides all need to be together. So offset each ring by half a segment. I like to actually, so I'm not guessing it. I like to make a center mark for a target. And I want to line that center mark up with a joint right below it. And I usually use a center finding ruler for that. I have several. If you use a, a pattern like I did, it's pretty simple. It probably doesn't matter. If, if you may have one out of order, who's going to ever know? I, I'm into to that. But, so now we're ready to start assembly of the rings. I had another ring here, but of course I didn't have any spare rings left over or that I could find. Um, go back to the slide. I, I was going to read something over there. When you get ready, these you you know you turn them, match your marks up, or you bricklay get it so that you know where it's going to go. Not just on that side, but on on, on opposing sides. Uh, you have to align marks on both sides to get them. And you want to center them. So that will require whatever you need to do. Maybe align a different, split them another way and, and give it a two, two directional. Anyway, when you put glue on these, this is another place I had problems and I didn't know it until too late. Put glue on there. These rings are not the same size, so, but when you put the glue in there, don't just put it on there and mash it, twist it a little bit, force some of that glue out of there. You want, you want extra glue out of there. Uh, I didn't do that well enough and I didn't clamp them well enough to drive the glue out with as many rubber bands as I used on each group. Um, I had spaces. I had to make a lot of glue and sawdust uh, filler. Mm. But 
You can't you can't find them. You could with a magnifying glass, I think. As you're assembling, you got to offset by half a segment. Get your brick lay to make your make your structure strong. Apply pressure with your hands with your glue. Made it to the next disc. This is where who was asking me about the width of those. I was. Andy used a pin nailer, stroke of genius, for for uh, building wedge shaped objects. And in this case, that's why I made the the inside diameter small, so I'd have plenty of room. When I went to stack it, I stacked it, smushed it, smushed all the glue out I could, took a pin nailer, bing, bing, close to the inside where I'd never get it with a chisel or a tool. There's no, you're not going to turn the inside of this. No reason to. You can if you want, but I don't know why you want it. That keeps them from sliding. Uh, that, the, that pin nailer thing, that, it wasn't going anywhere. Mm -hmm. I was cheap. I only used two pin nails on each one. Each one. Andy used three, I think. <laughs> Wasteful. So those are still on the inside? Yes. Yeah, they're they're in there hidden. Forever. Forever. <laughs> Hopefully. Now I've got I've got groups there of of segment rings glued together, rubber all rubber banded together. It turns out I should have figured out a way to apply a little more pressure on them just long enough to get the glue out. I didn't do that. I mean, a good eyeball would, would see that. Oh, I haven't got that. Those two segments are not, rings are not touching each other on that side. They're okay over here, but they're not okay over there. Mash them some more. Um, or use more rubber bands. Whatever it takes to get them together. That's what you do. Once you got them pin nailed, though, they won't, they're not going to twist. They're not going to slide. Meetings like this more often. So you put, you put two layers, two, two. Let's see. Let's go to the next slide. Anyway, I made 10 groups, six layers each. I believe that's what that said. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know if we need to even worry about this. Um, this is what I use. This option one is what I use, half ring method. That's what most segmenters use uh, if you're using an even number of segments. Uh, Andy didn't do his that way, at least not all the way through. I wanted to be able to take this half of the torus and the other half of the torus and fit them together and make those mating surfaces fit each other. So I, I, I went slow with this and I decided every time, don't take much wood off, let the sander slow down and you're going to use a disc sander. So this right side is going to be trying to throw that end of your workpiece up in the air and the other side is going to be pulling it down towards the table. So you want to take material off of both ends at one time evenly. You want to hold the piece up and down level if, if you need to build a little shim under it or something to do that. Do it. I, I don't think I had to do that, but um, I did have to sand them several times. And you're going to take those you're going to take two groups of, those, of six segments, and then you're going to put those together. So he says here, don't, oh, a, a good thing to do is have a speed square sitting there with you when you're trying to align these after you build them into the first groups. Uh, a speed square will help you keep keep that Taurus going in a straight line instead of trying to twist. You're still going to have to keep that fat sides all together. I think I think I did ten stacks of six, and then I glued the, those in pairs together. And I don't think at that point it was much of an issue. But when I started to glue those pairs together, the um, speed square helped a lot. What is a speed square? Oh, okay. So I've got this, imagine I've got these
imagine these are two groups of segments. If I start putting them together and start getting out here, how am I going to tell that this one is straight up and down and not tilted and starting to run off that way with a square uh, and close examination? You can. And before your glue dries, you can make a little adjustment or you can make your adjustment and make a mark on them and then go ahead. You won't, you'll only be able to use, use the pin nailer so long. You know, it's not very long, three or four layers and you can't get to six with, with a pin nailer, even though you're nailing them on the skinny side. I don't, I don't think you can get that far. You can get, you can get probably four at least, maybe five. Anyway, uh, so I combined two sets of large groups and one small section each to, to make two halves of the torus. There's somewhere in between. You see those real fat rubber bands? I ordered those from somewhere. And I have some, some that are probably thicker than that. Uh, several of them on there. But you got a you got that corner already started coming around curve, and you're trying to glue two of those together. They can get out of line, but a, a square will, will help you make sure that they're where they should be, should be in relation to each other. Also, when you can't use pin nailer anymore, and you're putting these larger segments together. Uh, you can use some uh, duct tape or masking tape on the outside edge. Get 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 the rotational orientation like you want it to be. Uh, put a piece of tape on it. It'll help you hold it. Uh, hold position. Yeah, it says there when they get too thick to pin nail, you can use duct tape down the sides to help hold your radial alignment while the glue sets enough to hold. Uh, so now then those there's there's two groups in a row, two big groups in a row and one little one. That's half the ring. And then there's the other half sitting there. Next slide, please. Now then we glued two of those sections together. And uh, we're doing pretty good until I got past there and started trying to put them all in the, the last step. Uh, and you still you're paying attention at every step. You're paying attention to your color, desired color arrangement. So I, I think those rings on the right are glued, and I, I don't. It looks like there's some glue kind of on the top one. It looks like I can see glue squeezed out about in the middle of that. Uh, so I'm, I'm assuming that's glued, and probably doesn't hadn't put all the rubber bands on it yet. Now, when I, this is after I fixed the problem where I had to use some of my spare rings. Uh, it's over there in the black, the dark section somewhere. But you can see it at, at uh, about 8 o'clock, there's a, there's a gap on the outside of that ring. That's where you use the drum sander. And you have to sand both faces of that half at the same time. Remove just a little bit of wood, do the other uh, section the same way. It helps me to take a pencil, make scribble lines all over those, and I can tell when I've sanded enough off so that I've got actually got a flat surface and have not left half of that at a different angle. You got to have some way of knowing. Uh, and also, holding that together. Down at the bottom left, you can probably see a piece of duct tape sticking off there that I neglected to re remove. And you can see at the top of that ring, you can see the, the uh, mechanical part of a ratchet strap, a small ratchet strap that I'm used to squish that together, the, the final squish. So next. I took them apart, reassembled them, and I still had the same problem, but now it's up at 10 o'clock. Same gap, or maybe it's a little smaller, but I hadn't fixed it yet. Next. 
Now we're getting somewhere. The half rings were sanded on this sander and refit with pressure every time. We used pressure until I got to fit to where I thought it was good enough. So it was actually it was perfect. Sand both faces on each half at a time. If you don't do that, then it's not going to work right. Uh, instead of a disc sander, you could also glue a piece of sandpaper to a flat surface and slide your disc back and forth. I don't like to do that because you introduce, put more pressure on this side than you do the other. Now you got a curve going the wrong way. Anyway, repeat until you're good. If I can't hardly see it on this picture here on this monitor. And for one thing, it's too far away from me to, but you'll see little red marks where I've got red marks a lot marks on it that's where i'd made uh as the assembly went along the ring assembly went along or the assembly of the finished rings went along i had low spots and high spots the red marks are in low spots so that i if i if there was something i could do to to, to alleviate that a little bit uh at least i know where the problem area areas were I you know, and during the chucking, that was important to be important also. We're all glued. All the little nubbies, the corners are all still, all still there. There's the, the actual, we're back to the finished product. We didn't show any turning yet. Uh, you can see the little uh, stand that we made for that it has some felt was sticky on one side it goes around that curve made something similar to that and i put i put some felt in there and i put a felt on a square on each corner of the bottom uh, most of the videos i've seen of people making tauruses after they've got they put all this work into making this torus and it's just absolutely lovely. Then they drill a hole in it so they can put a leg in it. I'm not going to drill a hole in that torus. What if you turn it the wrong direction or something? <laughs> I ain't going to do it. Are, are we out of slides? That's good. Uh, I, I had to divide this presentation up into two. So the next half of the presentation is going to be actually turning chucking and turning and uh, if you had have a, have a chance go to andy phillips uh, channel on youtube it's called um, organized chaos and i think it's spelled with the english spelling of organized anyway it's not exactly like i thought it would be but anyway if you put organized torus uh torus wood turning uh, you'll find Andy and find him. You watch, watch his, see what he does. He doesn't tell you anything though. So to get all this together to where I could actually do this, I had to watch pieces of that video over and over and over. And then I'd see where he turned something around and I got to see up oh, for just a half a second. There was a face plate there, but he didn't tell you that. <laughs> and he didn't say put a face plate there and then got a hole in the middle. None of that. So it was all pay attention to the video. So with with my added commentary, maybe y'all can figure out what he's doing. As always, be safe. Uh, some of the situations you're going to get in turning the the neck, the hole in that torus is going to get a little dicey. But <laughs> hey, so how many more are you going to make? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I was expecting none. <laughs> well, I've been thinking about making another one. All the magic happens in the next in the next one, so you definitely want to come back to see the uh, the process for getting that beautiful Taurus. When I sent these files to to Jim for his opinion, he's like, "I wondered how you helped that thing to turn it because it." 
I would have never thought to do it exactly that way. I'm not sure I would have ever figured out how to do it. How many rings did you did you uh, cut before you got that uh, fence uh, perfectly aligned to get the uh, ring tapered ring? Uh, I think I used three four inch blocks, and I only had I could only find half of one of these, but it had a mate. I think I I did have difficulty getting that sled close enough to the bandsaw blade. I think because of my material was so thin. If it had been thicker, I would have, I could have been been out. And you really don't. And any time I'm making segments, I don't even a segment for just a straight ring. You don't want that segment to run down to a point. I don't. I want a little bit of a flat there. Um, I don't remember the exact reasons, but I've been there before and I didn't like it, so I don't do that anymore. Um, it's near impossible to get them to a point. Well, then you got points sticking out. What are you going to do with them? They, they break off. You get them too thin. Then you got another problem. You can't find them and glue them back on. They don't, they'll never go back on there. In this thing, it doesn't really matter because all the skinny points were on the inside and, uh, in, in these rings and in, in, in the actual larger construction, second half of the construction. All the skinny sides of your rings were every one of them was supposed to be on the inside, lined up. All the fat sides were on, lined up on the outside. I can't think of anything else unless you have more questions. If I don't know the answer, I'll make something up. <laughs> <laughs> you want to pass these around? You, these... <laughs> That was really interesting. I, I'm glad that you did that for us. Thank you. How long did it but, take you to do the whole thing? Oh, God. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I could do one a lot faster now because you know what garage fade is? No. When you go in and watch and read your book or you watch somebody's DVD and you figure out that's how they did that. I run back out to the garage. How the hell did they do that? <laughs> That's garage fate. I would forget. <laughs> similar, to, I I, similar to losing the last tool that you had in your hand. What is uh, what is uh, Malcolm Tibbetts called the uh, segmented ring that uh, that uh, like a torus, but half of it goes around this way, and then instead of going back to meet the other side, it goes the opposite direction, and finally ends up after it knots itself back into the beginning he I made one that was a square knot looking thing that was actually two they weren't torses because they didn't come together but they were they were they were shaped in such a way they they made a, a square knot what's the name for those i can't remember i think he calls them ribbons Ribbon. yeah he makes ribbons that are flat as opposed to turned like a donut. He makes round, round ones too. Yeah. He's got uh, some He's that got are interlocking, interlocking rings donuts. Where one torus goes through the hole of the other one and then they both come back together. He's got one that's a figure eight looking arrangement. I don't, I'm not real sure how he did this. Uh, but I sent my son when I got this thing finished, I sent him a picture of it and he posted it on his, uh, Facebook page. And it, it wasn't long after that, that I got a, a nice note from Frank Parker and Malcolm Tibbetts. <laughs> and I don't know how they would have seen that. It's always amazing to me that that whole thing came out of two boards. Yeah. Uh, oh, uh, 12 inches left over. There was hardly anything left over. All of that maple piece. I mean, you wouldn't believe there's. It was, I was gluing in, in pieces that were off the end of a stick of, of my stock. I was gluing those back together to make a segment out of them. <laughs> I glued them back together 
and then mitered them to make a segment. <laughs> it worked. It worked. I've still got some of those. How um, many pieces in there? Did you, did you tell us that? Yeah, it was uh, 12 times 60. 816. 816. Plus 24 because of those two rings I had to add to, to fill up that gap. And uh, how did you uh, figure the angle uh, of the table of uh, the bandsaw blade? I think you said six degrees or something like that. I think it's 360 degrees divided by 60 pieces is, uh, is six degrees. Six okay. degrees. Yeah. That's it. I think so. Yeah. And if you were making normal segments, you would divide that by two. To put half the angle on each end of that segment, correct? Yep. But in this yep. case, that's correct. When we went through, we put the whole angle on on one side of that ring and made two rings, and they each had the same angle. Minimal loss of wood. Uh, so we had a six degree angle. That's when he used his board. Now the one I used, I actually didn't use the square. I'm, I marked my six degrees and I sawed that off. I sawed that six degree wedgie off of there. And then I put this piece and I can't tell which was the top, but I put this piece on the, on the table uh, to the operator's left of the bands of the blade and tilted the, the table mm -hmm. until the blade was flat on the end of that six degree angle. I can't get in front of the camera. <laughs> yeah, there, were, there, there was a picture um, of your bandsaw. I saw that part, but and what, what is a half inch bandsaw blade you had? I think that's what I had on there. How many teeth does it have? Is there I 